Good morning. <laughs> so um, I will start this very exciting session talking about Spanish Civil War and one specific aspect of it, which is the remembrance of air warfare and specifically of the Republican Air Force. Um, I'm interested in that because it is, uh, so I will focus the presentation not on the specific, let's say, activities that we develop as archaeologists and as uh, members interested of, of academic interest in heritage, but uh, on how these activities can actually contest official narratives uh, posed by a fascist dictatorship and how, let's say, archaeology in this context can be essential to understand or actually to change the remembrance of the past that society could have and what are the reasons behind this change and why this should be relevant beyond the case study that I will be discussing. So this is the summary of what I will be talking about. I will start with some context on uh, the war and when talking about uh, official narratives and then I will move to air warfare and discuss the activities we develop. So this is a real <coughs> concept of a context of the uh, war, if you are not um, aware of this, uh, this event. So this is a war that, uh, it's a civil war that developed in Spain just before the Second World War. And the very broad and simplistic summary of it is that a right-wing coalition um, where uh, the military, so the army had a very strong part of it, uh, in, tried to uh, make a coup d'etat to uh, force uh, go, uh, the left-wing government to go down and take control of the uh, country. In this context, uh, the coup d'etat kind of failed, and as it failed, it developed as a it quickly developed as a war between the two different sides. And in this context, uh, a very rarefied context because you had. Uh, all the tensions developed from the rise of fascism and Nazi, uh, Nazism in Europe. What happened is that the war escalated in a very weird way at the international level. So you had support from uh, Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, to uh, these uh, right-wing coalition, the nationalists. But at the same time, you had Soviet Union supporting the uh, Republicans and also uh, thousands of volunteers uh, um, in what was called the International Brigades trying to support the Republic against this uh, fascist um, side. So you have this context that it's, as you can see, kind of complex uh, because uh, it's, okay, it's a civil war, but you have a huge engagement from uh, uh, countries uh, around it. And these countries would ultimately uh, declare war to each other uh, months after the uh, uh, war finished. So uh, this is quite interesting. The other interesting bit here is that uh, the Nationalists won the war, and from 59 to 75, uh, you have a fascist dictatorship in Spain, and it's actually the longest one that you can find in Europe. It's, you can say in some uh, ways that it's the only war that the fascism won in Europe, and this generates a very interesting, uh, thing. well, not, not interesting, I think interesting is not the war, but a very unique situation where you have almost four decades where a fascist dictatorship can actually shape a country in Europe. Uh, and shaping that at the level of economy, at the level of culture, uh, things like banning languages, uh, killing or uh, forcing to exile or to jail thousands of political dissidents. And um, this was kind of uh, accepted by the democracies in Europe because in the context of the Cold War, it was a uh, valuable um, ally against the Soviet Union and the Pact of Warsaw. So that is the context that you have. And these 40 years shaped this narrative and the remembrance of the war. How, how is that? De uh, developed. So the idea here is that uh, the most important bit that Franco is wanted to explain is why did they uh, try to uh, destroy the Republic? Because somehow they are the rebels. Well, they are the rebels. They are the ones that are trying to uh, take a kind of a, de a democratic government by military force. So um, they justified that uh, saying that the Republic was a, a mess and it was a cause and as a consequence, they had to save the country from the Republicans. At the same time, um, the, uh, the nationalists committed a lot of crimes, like uh, well, uh, they killed uh, thousands of people, they had concentration camps after the war, a huge amount of repression everywhere. But what they just said, or the message is based on this idea that everybody was guilty, everybody committed crimes, kind of a very Catholic approach to uh, conflict and the idea here is that because everybody committed crimes, it doesn't really matter. Okay, uh, <laughs> uh, wait an hour, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So, so because everybody committed crimes, it doesn't matter how many or whatever. It's just that uh, let's forget about the past and let's focus on the future. Now we are a family again, and we can we can think about how to develop the country. So let's forget about about this past. And um, when democracy comes because Franco dies, uh, there's no real break with uh, fascism because what happened is that Franco actually chose the new head of the state, which was the king, as you can see here with Franco. And, uh, and there's what's called the Pact of Oblivion. 
So this pack is based on some ideas. One is that it, it will be, there will be an amnesty, so nobody can be prosecuted for the crimes developed during Francoism. Not the left wings that, uh, there were some of them that committed crimes, such as the uh, past terrorists, but also uh, nobody from the uh, fascist government can be prosecuted. And this generated a kind of a smooth transition, or this is sold as a smooth transition because it means that you didn't have conflict or, well, there was some conflict, but the general um, discourse is that this didn't happen. It was very smooth and very peaceful. And let's not talk about the past. This also means other things, such as that there are crimes against humanity that cannot be prosecuted, uh, that there's no real break in the discourse, and also that the losing side cannot say anything because we cannot reopen all wounds. So the narratives generated by Franco stays there even in democracy. Um, so that's the idea. And in this context, uh, because uh, there's this idea of the chaotic mess and uh, that uh, the Republic was not really an army, was not really a country anymore, it was not a government, and they were not in control of the territory. Some of the things that happened during the war, some of the aspects of it are kind of contesting this idea. And one of the most important ones here is air warfare. Why? Because air warfare is the most technologically advanced part or component of war in the 20th century. And from this context, if the Republican army had an air, an air force that actually contested the skies against the Nazi uh, Legion Condor, the Aviazione Legionaria from the Italian, uh, from the Italian and also the Nationalist Air War uh, Force, this kind of challenges the message. Because you are saying, oh, it's actually a standard army from the 20th century just as a Nationalist. And this is something that was not interesting. So in the message or in the narrative that was built after the, after the war, uh, air warfare was kind of suppressed from the whole discourse, or at least the Republican part of it. Um, the, as a general summary of what happened, uh, the uh, fascist aviation enjoyed numerical superiority, but um, at some point, the, uh, um, let's say the planes from the Republican army were better, at least the fighters, and what happened is that there was a contest of, of the air, uh, nationalists uh, experimented with lots of different new tactics that were actually uh, applied in uh, Second World War, specifically civilian bombing tactics from the c uh, cities, uh, mainly Madrid and Barcelona, also um, in interaction with uh, land forces in order to support them when they are attacking, etc. But you had this air supremacy contested until the end of the war, even if numerically speaking, the fascist aviation, especially in bombers, were much, much stronger. So uh, when democracy comes, what happens here is that Historians will focus on the civilian casualties. They will focus on the bombing of the cities, which is interesting, but they completely ignore the fact that there was an air force uh, trying to defend the uh, civilian population from the attacks from the fascist aviation. And this is very interesting because on the one hand, yes, you are criticizing Franco and you are criticizing uh, the nationalists because they are uh, actually killing people and their plan is just to kill people. Uh, on the other hand, you are actually strengthening this message, this discourse from Franco where the Air Force was not existent, so the Republican Army was a mess. The Republican was the Republic was not a real government, and as a consequence, people were completely, uh, let's say, defenseless against what happened on the skies and uh, the fascist uh, bombers coming to destroy uh, the city. So it's like uh, to draw a parallel here. It's like if you talk about, about the Battle of Britain and you completely ignore Fighter Command and RAF. So you just talk about the Blitz and you just talk about how the Nazi uh, Luftwaffe destroyed the English cities, which is exactly what uh, is the discourse that is used in Spain right now about talking about the air warfare. So it's the, the few, so the pilots that were defending the Republic from these bombings do not exist on this discourse. Um, in this context is where this uh, project that we develop in the University of Barcelona, the University of Edinburgh, uh, comes uh, into terms because the idea here is let's try to explain a different story of that. Let's try to complement this discourse about uh, civilian bombings with the discourse about who were these people, who were the few, uh, where were the airfields, and what type of archaeological information or archaeological evidence can you get from this contest for air supremacy. So this can come from very different places. And what we decided here is that one of the things that we wanted to use is uh, geographical information systems because it would allow us to generate this scale of space or uh, let's say what are the evidence uh, across, um, in this case, um, Catalonia that you can find in terms of uh, the Republican Air Force and what's the evidence le left in the territory on the landscape about it. Uh, things like uh, mapping all the bombings from the city of Barcelona, as you can see here, there has been several projects relating this information, with, so we just use the information but also mapping where were the main uh, airfields from the Air Force 
and uh, what type of uh, place where did you have here and collecting also are linking, let's say, this special information with everything related to oral tradition, uh, historical records, memories of pilots, etc. Et Specifically relevant here, this is the area here called the Glorious Nest. This is the area where uh, most uh, fighter squadrons were deployed defending the uh, Republican troops during the Battle for the Europe, which was the most important and uh, final battle of the war that was being developed here during the summer of uh, 38. Um, this was accompanied by uh, the survey of different of some of these airfields, the ones that were most accessible in terms of archaeology. So uh, the strategy was field surveys using metal detecting to identify, um, to identify uh, or uh, catalog and collect and record geo, geo uh, and georeference uh, metal objects related to these uh, to these airfields, following the methodology developed by Battlefield Archaeology. And we uh, link that also with geophysical and remote sensing studies of the different structures that you can find in the airfields, including air shelters, but also cataloging uh, houses or buildings that were like farmhouses that were used as, uh, let's say, uh, different uh, structures related to the airfield. So when the airfield is created, they use the, the, these farmhouses to, for example, uh, store ammunition or uh, um, create some uh, buildings where the pilots can actually rest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So GIS was useful here because then it allows us to connect everything. On the one hand, you have all these uh, written records, and these written records talk about the specific buildings. You have the buildings in the landscape. You can actually link the, and georeference these uh, sources. But also, you have tons and tons of aerial, photo uh, aerial photos, mainly from the Italian Air Force and the, uh, and the Legion Condor, the German Air Force, where they were developing these techniques where I, after bo the bombing, you uh, photograph the damage in order to assess and to what extent you were effective when you were attacking these airfields. Uh, by georeferencing these images, you can also actually understand what it has been the, what has been the change in terms of landscape and what parts of in terms of heritage, what parts of the airfields are actually more interesting to memorialize because they are the most well preserved in terms of the fields. But also, if you have here, yeah, you can see. Some highways in the middle, so clearly this area has been almost destroyed. But uh, some of the other areas where you have actually buildings that were used are quite interesting and quite well preserved. On top of that, you can link the remote sensing and the output from the uh, metal detecting service with the same uh, with the same maps. And as a consequence, you have an integrative approach to the landscape generated or the landscape uh, that has uh, seen the preservation of these airfields that have been quite invisible for the last uh, 60 to 70 years. On, um, beyond research, uh, we have been also interested in connect, reconnecting these airfields where the people uh, that have been living there. So uh, this is not about the bombings of the cities, but more about uh, the people living in the places that were transformed into airfields. For some years, these were airfields, so lots of them, lots of people, they have childhood memories of um, watching these pilots or seeing the planes, or actually some uh, some of them even have memories of the bombings of the nationalist um, squadrons against these airfields. So the idea here is we develop two different strategies. One of them is to create a small uh, visitor center in the area in one of the most well-preserved airfields. So one of the farmhouses that was used as a headquarters for one of the squadrons was transformed into the Siaga, which is the uh, this visitor center for the Republican Air Force. You can see here part of the exhibition where you have like, the usual stuff in. Uh, exhibitions of this type uh, from explaining what was the system from when they re uh, received this uh, um, this uh, warning of incoming aircraft to uh, the scramble and going out to intercept them uh, to uh, the type of aircraft that you had, the technology, also how were these aircraft uh, built, etc., etc. But also you have uh, some guided visits based on uh, some interactive panels outdoors that can be used to actually understand the relation between this air warfare and the landscape where you are actually walking. Um, finally, the last step is beyond the airfields to uh, promote a different perspective on the past by creating uh, digital illustrations, um, recreating some of these most important events related to the battles, such as the first uh, bombing to the city of Barcelona. You can see here, uh, one of the interesting bits is that people living in the city will actually recognize some of these buildings. This is the Ramla, which is one of the most touristy streets of the city. So. Uh, by linking these events of bombing to uh, important areas of the city that everybody recognizes, you are actually trying to connect this past or this remembrance with the present and trying to uh, create, let's say, a different approach to the past where it's not just based on black and white images and text. Uh, on top of that, you have other things like trying to explain this idea of the 
uh, Air Force defending the city from these uh, bombings, and it has been published in this book that uh, is in Catalan Spanish, I think, and uh, can be um, can be uh, both by uh, people interested in these topics. Finally, you have the memorialization in the sense that beyond heritage, beyond trying to explain to the local communities what happened there, uh, there are some people that are still alive that were protagonists of this, uh, very few people right now. But the, uh, the research group at the University of Barcelona is linked to the uh, uh, ADAR, which is the Association of uh, Republican Aviators from the Republic. Uh, so what we did here is to develop a set of activities where we involve the local community with the pilots that live there during this uh, traumatic years and also memorialize the events by um, by uh, linking this museum, this visitor center, with some um, uh, plaques where we actually remember the uh, the task that these uh, Republican soldiers or Republican pilots were developing to defend the skies from the bombings of the uh, fascist aviation. Uh, to conclude, um, in this context where you have one of the sides trying to silence the past um, and creating this narrative where you shouldn't talk about that, archaeology it will never be neutral because the only fact that you are doing archaeology is politically active. Uh, because if someone says you shouldn't talk about that and you find evidence of what happened there, obviously you are talking about the past. And as a consequence, you will be contesting this official narrative. Um, in this sense, um, I think it's very important because uh, let's say that archaeology can em uh, empower the silence in a way that probably written history cannot, especially because you're re reconnecting the landscape with the events. And that is something very powerful and that we have been trying to use his, uh, here in a very active way. So you are generating a new, new ways of remembering the past. But then uh, one question I would like to ask, and I hope that in the discussion we can have some chat about that, is this idea here. Yes, we are generating new heritage if you want to, or new interpretation of heritage that has been silenced or forgotten or purpose for the official narrative. But what happens with everything that has been used by this official narrative and that you try to contest? So one of the most classical examples is the Valley of the Fallen, where uh, Francisco Franco was actually buried. And this was very important in the news like some months ago because what happened is that the left-wing uh, government, uh, just before the elections, because there were elections, removed Franco from this place. But the discourse is still there. The narrative is there because uh, in this uh, valley where you have thousands of soldiers from both sides that were uh, buried together uh, without asking permission to the families, in the case of the Republican ones. But it's reinforcing this message that everybody is guilty, that it's, it's like a shared traumatic past without making distinctions between winners and losers, because clearly the winner does not want to do that. So what should we do with this um, heritage that is actually reinforcing this official narrative of a fascist regime? And within a democratic uh, context where you can act want actually to talk about that because it's probably the best way to keep your democracy healthy, how can you actually deal with that, with victory arts, with uh, um, remembrance and memory and heritage related to, for example, the participation of fascist volunteers in the nationalist side, thanking them for their, for their help. Um, thank you. <laughs>